So, Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Uh, Lord, we just ask that you come and join us, that you come and guide us as you so see fit, that you come pour out your mercy upon our heads, that we might see you through this text, especially as we embark upon just a new season, Lord, a new year. Uh, Lord, we love you. It's in your sweet son's name we pray. Amen. Uh, today is a bit different because today we're doing uh, a topical sermon. We're doing a seasonal sermon. Now, uh, it's still in line with what we've been talking about. We're still in the book of Genesis. And we're still like in Genesis 12, which is where we would naturally be. Uh, but we're going to actually pause and sit uh, and hyper focus in on basically one or two verses in the book of Genesis for just a moment for just this Sunday. Now, typically we don't do topical messages. We don't really do seasonal messages. Uh, there's nothing wrong with topical messages or seasonal messages, but a good way to view a topical message is it's a lot like a dessert, okay? It's okay to have it occasionally. It's okay to have more of it during the holidays, all right? But you eventually need to get back to your regular nutritious Diet and what that is for us is that's typically just going through the text and uh, presenting the text the way that's presented to us here. The difference between a topical message and your normal, I think you probably refer to it as a pericopal expository message series, is a topical in, in a normal series is we let the text set the agenda. We let the Lord ask questions of himself and then he answers them for us. Uh, in a topical message, we are asking a question of him and then probing the scriptures to see what his response is. It's a bit like um, if you were a disciple and you were hanging out with Jesus, the majority of the time, you would probably not be raising your hand and saying, okay, we'd like you to answer this question, then this question, then this question, then we'd like you to dive into this category, and then we'd like you to dive into this particular ology. Uh, you would rather say to him, if you were hanging out with Jesus, you tell us what you want to talk about, and we're just going to take notes. You know what I'm saying? But on occasion, as a disciple, you would raise your hand and you'd ask a question. You'd direct his attention to something that you need, probably to address a felt need that you might have. But for the most part, what a church should be doing is coming to the Lord and not saying, we want you to speak on this, 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 and this, but coming to him and saying, what do you want to teach us? And what he says is just go through my books and talk about what it talks about. Does that make sense? Today, we are doing a topical message. It's okay on occasion to have a little bit of dessert, all right? As long as the dessert does not replace your regular dietary consumption. You guys track with me? Okay, all that having said, we're still in Genesis 12. We're still um, <clears throat> moving along with the story. We're just pausing for half a minute in what we're going to be seeing and recognizing <clears throat> as the call of Abram, or I'm gonna say the call of Abraham. I'm gonna use Abram and Abraham interchangeably, all right? All my disclaimers aside, how you doing? You guys ready to rock and roll? Okay question you might have is, what topical message are we covering? What question are we asking? What seasonal thing are we tackling? And the answer is, it's day two of a new year. And even if you're not a resolutions type person, uh, even if you don't believe in New Year's resolutions, at the start of a new year, oftentimes we're kind of asking uh, ourselves, our spouse, the Lord, what's next? What do you have for me in this next season? Uh, what do you want me to do? Where, where do you want me to go. So even if you don't have anything big going on in life, usually the new year prompts a question like this, like, Lord, where would you have me go? What would you have me do? Uh, what, what's the next thing that you have for me in the next season of my life? Others of us aren't just asking that because of, um, because of the time of year. Others of us are asking that because circumstances have changed maybe in our life. Uh, I just literally, I was telling Jenna last night, I can, I can put on two hands the conversations I've had with people here in our body who are contemplating some serious changes in their life. Those changes could be, it could be a business venture or investment that you're considering and you're wondering, Lord, what would you have me do? Where would you have me go? What's next? Uh, how would you have me pursue or not pursue this potential opportunity? Uh, some of us are contemplating career changes. Some of us are thinking about going into retirement. Some of us are thinking about coming out of retirement. Uh, some of us are thinking about uh, relational um, decisions in our life. Should I date this guy? Should I date this girl? Should I continue dating this guy? Should I continue dating this girl? Should I consider this particular person for marriage? Should I propose? Should we get married? Um, I'm not giving the option of saying, should I get out of this marriage? That's not on the table. Um, uh, it could be that you're thinking through some family decisions right now. Um, like, I'll let you know, I have skin in the game in this message because Jen and I are thinking through two big questions. And one is, uh, 
should we maybe have more kids? Is that what the Lord would have for us moving forward? I'm still trying to get a refund for the kids that we did get. I'm going to the hospital. I'm going to heck, you know, you can tell me about all this. Uh, the other thing with Jen and I is right now, you know, we've got two kids. She goes back to work full time on Tuesday. And uh, we're thinking, uh, Lord, would you have us um, continue to serve in her current capacity or have us remove? And if so, with the timing and all that stuff. So we're thinking through some big things. I would imagine you're thinking through some big things. Some of us are thinking we've got aging parents. What do we do with them? Do we bring them to us? Do we put them in a home? Do we, uh, some of us have unruly kids, uh, either in our home right now or elsewhere and abroad, and we're thinking, how do I interact? What do I do? What, what does it look like to engage in that relationship? Um, some of us are wrestling with, um, some of us are students in the room, and the question on our mind, and these are big questions, especially when you're a student. What classes do I take? What sports should I invest in? What schools do I apply to? What major should I pursue? What school do I eventually commit to? That's a huge decision, and all of us with these big life decisions are looking at the Lord and saying, okay, what would you have me do? Where do you want me to go? What's next for me? God, will you give to me um, clarity on your will that I might uh, honor you in my decisions? Um, I know that's just a few of us here, but I would imagine all of us could resonate with one question or another, especially as we're jumping into a new year and we're sometimes around this time of year asking the question, Lord, what's next? Where would you have me go? What would you have me do? Fortunately, by the grace of God, where we naturally land in our progression in this text is today we're looking at the call of Abram, or I'm just going to start saying Abraham. In this text helps weigh in on that question, specifically the question when we come to the Lord and say to him, what would you have me do? Or even more specifically, where would you have me go? What do you want of me, Lord? That's what this text briefly answers for us as we see God coming to Abraham and he says to him, hey, it's a new season. I'm calling you into a new life. I want you to go. And Abraham turns to him and says, okay. So it's my hope that uh, as we jump into a new year, to jump into this text, that the Lord will give you a little bit of wisdom, a little bit of discernment on what he might have for you moving forward in 2022 or um, yeah, in the next season or thing that he's going through. Clear? You guys track with me? All right. Let's jump in. If you got your Bibles, Genesis 12, 1 through 4. Super short text. <clears throat> We're on the heels of the Tower of Babylon. I'm going to resist giving you any more historical context. We're going to do all that stuff next week. We're going to actually properly explain this text next week. Today we'll be just addressing the question of calling. Here we go. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make for you a great nation. And I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse, and in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. So Abram went, as the Lord told him, and Lot went with him. Abram was 75 years old when he departed from Haran. All right, this is the famous call of Abram, or Abraham, in Genesis 12. And this is a huge text. When we're battling through the question of, Lord, what do you have for me next? Where do you want me to go? This text is humongous. And there's a big, giant problem in this text. Imagine for a minute that you're Abraham. And all of a sudden, God, who you don't really know, shows up to you. And he says, I want you to go from your family, from your household. I want you to leave everything that you've ever known. And I want you to go to the world, to the land that I will show you. Now, there's a problem with that. You might not strike you initially. But there's a huge two problems with that. The first is this. Back then, uh, it was an agrarian society. And so if you were called to leave the land that you're in, that's walking away from your business, and it doesn't transfer over. Not to mention, your wealth is not in bank accounts, and you can't get wire transfers. Your, your wealth is measured in your land, and it's also measured in your cattle. So here is Abraham, <clears throat> 75 years old, just hitting retirement age, he's looking forward to time on the golf course, when all of a sudden God says, hey, I want you to uproot from everything you've ever known, everything you've accumulated, and I want you to go. So that's the first thing. This is the Lord coming to you after you finally finished your house, right? Everyone knows the Willow County transitions. You move here, and you're in some, like, 
dumpy rental that can't hold heat to save its life, right? And then you decide to build, so you jump into a camper, and you thought it'd only be three months, but you're there for two and a half years, right? You finally build your house, and Abram finally builds his house, and finally has everything laid out for him, he walks into it, and all of a sudden, God, I want you to uproot, and I want you to move. So that's a huge problem that Abraham has. But not only that, take a look at the text, Miss Jenny, I'm gonna have you go back, if you don't mind, if you can, to the first part of the text. And it's this, look what the Lord says to Abram. He speaks to him in tongues. Now, okay. It says, now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. Go to the land that I will show you. That might not strike us when we just initially read through this text. This would have been a huge problem. This is God saying to you, I want you to move. I want you to uproot your family. I want you to pack everything in the U-Haul and I'm not even going to tell you where you're going. What? This is God saying, I want you to go and be a missionary. I want you to hop on a plane and go be a missionary. And you say, okay, where am I flying to? And he says, just go to the airport. Just hop on a plane. What? What, what, what is going on here? This is God calling Abram, and this is how he calls him. I want you to uproot from everything you've known, and I just want you to go. Where am I going? Is the big question that you should be asking. And the second question you should be asking is, why does God call Abram like this? And could he call or be calling me in the exact same way? Big question we have to wrestle with in this is, why does God call Abram that way? And why does he oftentimes call us this way too? Here's the answer of the text. I know that Abraham is going to land in Canaan. You know that Abraham is going to land in Canaan. God knows that Abraham is going to land in Canaan, the eventual promised land. But Abraham doesn't have a clue. Why? Because what we see in our own lives and what we see in Scripture is this. Is the moment that God tells Abraham, I'm going to be sending you to Canaan, I'm going to be sending you to the promised land, what is Abraham going to do? He's going to take his eyes off of following the Lord He's going to put him on Canaan. He's going to say, thanks for the direction, Lord. I'll check you later. And he heads off that way. So what the Lord does in this text is he doesn't tell him where he's going, lest Abraham take his focus off the Lord and leave him in the dust and head on to his new adventure, to his new pursuit, to his new job, to his new career, to his new call. And here's the thing. God does this with you and I all the time. I don't know right now if it's a career change that you're considering. I don't know if it's a business venture. I don't know if it's a real estate thing. I don't know if it's a family thing. You're trying to figure out where to place mom, where to put kids, what school to go to, or what relationship to engage in, what relationship to disengage in. I don't know what it is, but oftentimes we look at the Lord and say, okay, just tell me where you want me to go. Just tell me what you want me to take this job. You want me to take this job. And the Lord doesn't give us a response. Why doesn't he do it? Because he knows our tendency. The moment that he tells us, I want you to take that job over there. Thanks, Lord. I'll check you later. And we head in this direction, leaving him in the dust. One of the things that we learn from the call of Abram is what the Lord oftentimes does is he does not give us a destination. Instead, he looks at us and he says, keep your eyes fixed on me. And I want you to follow me inch by inch, step by step, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, decade by decade. Don't take your eyes off of me, is what he teaches us here in this text. Right now, you could be considering, God, if you'll just tell me this job, and the reason that the Lord doesn't is he says, I don't want you to put your eyes on that job and leave me in the dust. I want you to keep your eyes on me. Eventually, I may lead you that way. You may eventually find yourself, as Abraham does, in Canaan, in the promised land, but you're not going to do it by the Lord pointing you in that direction so that you can leave him in the dust. He's going to be saying, as Jesus says consistently in the New Testament, follow me. Eyes right here. Follow me. Eyes right here. That's the first <clears throat> thing we learn about the call of the Lord in Abraham's life and often how he works in our lives when we're thinking through big decisions. But here's the second. Um, you have to ask yourself, why doesn't the Lord just give him the destination? Um, what is another reason why the Lord doesn't just tell him where he's supposed to go? And the whole point of the text is this. Is God has not come down to lead you to some destination. God has come down to be your destination. 
Abraham could say to the Lord in this situation, God, where do you want me to go? What do you want me to pursue? Where do you want me to land? What do you want me to focus on? Where do you want me to invest? Where do you want me to spend my time, my love, my affection? Where do you want me to be? And God is saying, right here, Abraham, right here. I'm not leading you to a destination. I am your destination. We've talked about this all throughout scripture. God is not a means to an end. He is the end in and of himself. What he longs to do in your life is simply and only lead you to himself. He's not leading you to some grand vision, some other destination. He's leading to you. He's leading you to himself as the destination. This is consistent all throughout scripture. We're going to see, uh, do you guys remember the story in Exodus when God is uh, leading the Israelites around in the wilderness and eventually God gets fed up with the Israelites and he says to Moses, you know what? He's basically like, here's the keys to the promised land. You guys can just have the place. You guys go over there. I'm hanging out here. This rebellious people, you guys can just have the promised land. Do you remember what Moses says? This is like the high point in Moses' life. He says to the Lord, if you don't go with us, we don't want to go. It's not the promised land if you're not there. We're not in it for the land. We're in it for the Lord. We're in it for you. We don't want your stuff. We want yourself. This is the mantra of scripture. This is what the Lord is calling us to, not to some other destination. He's calling us to himself as the destination. He is not a means to an end. He is an end in and of himself. This is consistent all throughout scripture. Um, in the Psalms, David says this, consider it. He says, whom have I in heaven but you? And earth has nothing I desire but you. Basically, David's saying to God, I don't want to go to heaven if you're not there. I'm not in it for the golden streets. I'm not in it for the angels. I'm not in it for uh, feeling good. I'm not in it for the lack of pain. I'm in it for you. And if you're not there, I don't want to go. And the, the call of scripture in that text is, yes and amen, finally David gets it. In the New Testament, John 6, we walk through this text. Do you remember? There are thousands of people that literally come to Jesus saying, we love you, we love you, we love you. And Jesus says, you don't really love me for me. You love me for my stuff. And when Jesus doesn't give him his stuff, all the people walk away. Thousands of people, it could be 5, 15, 5, 10, 15, 20,000 people, walk away from Jesus, and all that's left is the 12. And Jesus looks at his disciples and says, guys, aren't you going to walk away too? Everyone else is gone. And Peter says to him, Lord, where would we go? You have the words of eternal life. God, we're not in it for your stuff. We're in it for yourself. We don't want you to lead us to a destination. We see you as the destination, and we're not going anywhere. And Jesus says to him, blessed are you, Simon, Simon son of Barjona. Has God not revealed this to you? The mantra of scripture is this. God is not leading you to some destination. He's leading you to himself as the destination. The question that scripture wants you to answer or wrestle with is this is that enough for you is that the destination that you are um, looking for are you satisfied with that or are you using god as a means to an end to get into the career that you really want to pursue to get into the relationship that you really like to have to be in the new house that you really like to enjoy and spend the rest of your life and retire and have grandkids and stuff like that is god to you, a means to an end, or an end in and of itself. My old Bible teacher used to say this. Um, he used to say, the worst thing that God could give you is he, the worst thing God could do to you is to give you what you want if what you want is not himself. And it could be that you've been crying out to the Lord for direction and discernment and wisdom on where to go, and he's been silent in his response because he knows that ultimately you're coming to him as a means to an end to get to another destination, and the Lord is lovingly refusing not to give it to you. He's now saying to you, as he does to Abraham in his text, keep your eyes on me, follow me, focus on me. It's not about there, it's all about right here. Listen, Abraham's eventually going to land in the promised land. And I'm only going to say, kind of. Um, 
he's going to eventually become a great nation, but not in his lifetime, so it's kind of. But if you were to ask Abraham at the end of the day what this whole journey was about, it wasn't about him going to the promised land, it wasn't about him becoming a great nation, it wasn't about him having descendants and becoming a people, it wasn't about him becoming Father Abraham, it was all about him simply falling, following, and falling more in love with the Lord. And if that's all Abraham gets at the end of the day, that is for him enough. How do I know? Because when God finally knocks on his door and says, hey, the one thing that I've been leading you up to, which is your son Isaac, I want you to kill him, Abraham says to him, gladly, I'll offer him up. We'll get there in Genesis 22. So, two things we learned from one verse. It's this. Um, when it comes to trying to discern the will of the Lord for our lives, where he wants us to go, what he wants us to do. His first response is to us, follow me, keep your eyes on me, inch by inch, step by step, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year. Keep your eyes on me. I'm not going to point you in the direction. I'm not going to tell you the direction. I'm just going to have you follow me, and eventually you might find yourself in that career, in that relationship, in a different place entirely. You may find yourself in the promised land, but it's not about the promised land. It's all about the promised sir. It's not about the land. It's about the Lord. Second thing is... Um, the Lord is not calling you to some destination that's not himself. He's calling you unto himself. That's what this whole journey of life is all about. Does that make sense? Now, that having been said, we still are maybe wrestling with the question of, okay, I'm getting that, I'm growing in that, I'm asking the Lord to develop me in that, but now what do I do when next week I've got college applications due, or um, at the end of this quarter I've got to make a decision career-wise on what I'm pursuing, or relationally, you know, we're starting to have, you know, in-depth, deep talks and kind of need to make a decision. Now what do I do, um, what do I do in the meantime as I'm pursuing the Lord? Uh, what would this text have for me? You know, um, I think the text would have you do this when you're actually trying to now discern between, in Abraham's case, do I go to Canaan? Do I go to Egypt? Do I go back to Haran? Where do I go? Uh, do I go to the Valley of Shinar? Where, where do you want me to go, Lord? I think what the Lord would have you do is what Abraham eventually does, which all you see in the text of Abraham doing is he's walking, following the Lord, and when the Lord speaks, Abraham responds. He hears the word of the Lord, and he does it. Now, here's the thing. You and I look at this text, and we may say, oh, well, that's so nice for Abraham because God spoke with him. He dialogued with the Lord. And God just told him where he wanted to go, and that's where he went. And I draw your attention to this from what we can see in Scripture. There's only a few times in Abraham's really long life that God shows up and speaks to him. Uh, which means this. God is speaking to you more regularly through his word than he did periodically or occasionally in the life of Abraham. So how do you discern what's next for you in your life? You do what Abraham did, which is you press into the word of the Lord and you say, okay, what's next? I have my eyes on you. In this whole venture, I only want you. Now, where do you want me to go? And he's saying to you, do what Abraham did. Listen to my word and press into it. The big question you have to wrestle with or the big aim of 2022 is this. Are you getting into his word? Do you know his word? He's speaking. He longs to direct you. Are you listening? Are you jumping in? Will you heed his instruction when he gives it? And he's, um, most of us carry the word of God in our pocket on a daily basis. And the fact that we have a Bible app or something like that. And most of us, many times, in big decisions, we never consult him. God is speaking. He's directing you. He's directing you through his word. That's how he directed Abraham. That's how he's going to direct you. So if you want to know which way, this way, that way, the, the, the answer of the Lord from his word is read my word. Okay? Does that make sense? Get track with me? All right. Um, now, the next question we might wrestle with is, um, okay, I'm following the Lord. I'm focusing on the Lord. Um, I'm prioritizing the Lord. Ultimately, I don't want something from him. I just want him, and I just want to do his will. I'm in the category, the career, the job, the relationship that he places me in. So um, now I'm pressing into his word, and now it seems as though maybe the Lord has brought me to a crossroads. It seems as though I've um, searched out his word, it's weighed into it, and now I have two options on the table, and now I'm crying out to the Lord, what would you have me do? And I don't hear anything in response. What do I do then? Sorry, this message is jumbled. Let me back up one second. Just say this. When you're jumping into God's word, jump into the Proverbs. Uh, our men from Men's Bible Study can attest to you how specific and niche 
the Proverbs are to weigh into every single aspect of your life. So if you're battling through a big decision right now, I'd encourage you to spend an entire month in the Proverbs. Just meditate on one chapter a day. And say, Lord, teach me wisdom. Literally, the point of the book is God saying, I want to teach you wisdom so that you can navigate this life. Press into his word and have it weigh in on it. Now, let's say you've done that. You've saturated yourself in his word. You're focusing on him. You're following him. Now, you've got two options. I can continue to pursue this relationship, or we can remain friends. Um, I can jump into this career trajectory. I can jump into this retirement plan. I can pursue this insurance policy this year. I can jump into this medical procedure. I can not, I can wait, I can put it off. Now I've got two options on the table. What do I do? If you're anything like me, I just sit there and I freak out, right? <laughs> I get into this analysis paralysis, and I'm like, I don't know. Um, and I would imagine you might be a little bit like me, you might be a little bit like Jenna, like, I don't know, it seems as though we're not talking about this is a sinful entity and this is a wise entity and I don't know which one to choose. This is clearly not what the Lord's word would have for me at the top of the table. But I'm talking about, do I go and serve the orphans or do I go and serve the widows, right? Uh, two good options. Do I go to Safeway, do I go to Dollar Stretcher? You see what I'm talking about? We're talking like neutral things here, or godly pursuits, okay? And I sit here and I freak out. Okay, now what am I doing when I freak out? First, I'm not listening to his word. Because what does he tell me? In Matthew 5, I believe in God. Therefore, I tell you, don't be anxious about your life. What you shall eat, what you shall drink, or about your body, what you shall put on. For is life not more than uh, food, and the body more than clothing? Consider the birds of the air, consider the lilies of the field. Was not Solomon in all of his splendor clothed more than these? Uh, why are you worrying about your life? Who can add a single hour to his life by worrying about it? Rather, seek his kingdom first and all these things will be added up to you. And here I am saying, yeah, I get that, but I'm freaking out, right? And what am I doing in that moment? I'm discarding his, I'm not listening to his word. So I know we say all the time, well, I've sought out his word, but I'm still freaking out about this thing. If you're freaking out about it, you have not let his word penetrate into your soul the way that it was intended to do. So you sit there and you say, okay, Lord, I trust you with my anxiety. I'm following you, I'm freaking out, Lord, but I'm following you. Help me understand who you are. So that's one thing I do, all right? But then... Proverbs, we read it in men's Bible study this past week, says um, uh, a man's heart is like deep waters. It takes a, man, it's, a man's heart is like deep waters, and it takes a man of understanding to draw out his intentions, his understandings, his affections, and stuff like that. So when I sit and think about, okay, why am I really freaking out? I would imagine it's the same reason that you freak out when you've got to make a decision. Um, sometimes one of the reasons I freak out is this. I'm afraid if I make the wrong decision, God isn't going to like me anymore. I'm afraid that if he had this career path for me and I chose over here, now God's like, dang it, Dave. This is why I don't like you, right? And what am I doing in that moment? I'm saying that God's love for me is dependent upon what I do and what I've done. But what does scripture say? God's love for me is not dependent upon who I am and what I've done. God's love for me is dependent upon who Christ is and what he's done on my behalf. So even in me freaking out in these like neutral options, it's me not listening to the word of the Lord because I think that his love for me is dependent upon who I am and what I've done. As opposed to what his word screams, which is his love is dependent upon who he is and what his son has done on my behalf. Does this make sense? That's one of the reasons I freak out. The other reason I freak out in this whole thing is... Uh, maybe I'm not afraid that God's not going to love me, but I'm like, well, I just don't want to thwart his will. I don't want to step outside of the will of God. Listen to yourself and throw that reasoning at scripture and see how it holds up. What does scripture unanimously declare? You cannot thwart the will of God. He's sovereign and supreme over everything. And you think, Dave, you're going to Safeway or going to Dollar Stretcher is going to somehow throw all that out of whack? You're not listening to my word, is what he says. Does this make sense? What you do is you take your thoughts, you take your affections, and you try and jam them through the filter of scripture, and you see what comes out on the other side. And it's usually for me in these moments, not good stuff. And I have to say to the Lord, okay, Lord, sorry, I repent. Um, and I let his word reign supreme in my decision making. So, I say to the Lord in big decisions, little decisions. Lord, I, I, help me to keep my eyes on you. Help me to see you as the destination. I'm not trying to get something from you. I'm just trying to get more of you, and I'm just trying to discern which way you would have me go. I'm letting your word weigh in on my decisions, and I'm talking actually getting into his word on a daily basis so you know his thoughts, so it informs all your decisions, and you're not just saying, yeah, I read a bumper sticker one time, and that makes me lean in this direction. I'm talking about getting into his word. 
And then, now the Lord, you're, you're looking, you're saying, I still don't see that it's abundantly clear. Um, so Lord, I trust you. And you know what? If it's okay with you, um, knock me down dead if you don't want me to go this way. But I'm going to trust your word and I'm going to go this way. You know what you have to do when you decide to finally make a decision and you're not sure if that's what, what the Lord's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know what you have to do? You still have to keep your eyes on him. You kind of do this number, like, okay, I'm going here. Is this okay? All right, we're doing good. Am I going here? Okay, all right, we're doing okay. And you know what's happening is you're doing what he wanted you to do all along, which is to keep your eyes on him throughout that relationship, throughout that career. We have a tendency to be like, this way? Okay, we'll check you later and I'll go this way. No, he's wanting us to say, okay, is this okay? All right, is this okay? And daily dependent upon him, asking him, what do you want from me? I want to honor you, I want to please you, and I'm going to be doing this by keeping my eyes on him. Does that make sense? This is how um, we see God informing how we make decisions in relationship with him, by keeping our eyes on him, by seeing him as the destination, not trying to get something from him, but just trying to get him and honor him in our decisions by applying his word to our life. Now, here's what you may be thinking. Um, Dave, I've done that, and I was following the Lord, and I was fixing my eyes on him, and I was searching out his word, and his word says to seek wise counsel. I sought wise counsel, and I went this way, and everything fell apart. Everything um, hit the fan. Everything went sour. So I hear what you're saying, but I'm not going to do that because I've done that before, and it all went south, it all went sour. One question for you What makes you think that the Lord, when you're following Him, would not lead you straight into failure? What makes you think that when we're following the Lord, He's going to always lead us into green pastures? and still waters. What we see consistently in Scripture is when people keep their eyes on the Lord and they're following Him, they're following Him that He leads them straight into failure. I'm not talking moral, moral failure and I'm not talking a sin. It's about sin. I'm talking about uh, failure in the, in the eyes of the world. You, you choose that career path with your eyes on Him and all of a sudden you lose your job. You buy that house and it turns out to be a Willowa County limit. All right, you uh, you bring your uh, mother mother-in-law into your home, and it screws up the entire dynamic in the family. Right? You go off to that college, and it wrecks and ruins the next four years of your life. And we have a tendency to look at the Lord, saying, "I was following you, and now all of a sudden, it all went really, really bad for me." And so I'm not going to do that. The question is, is what makes you think that God did not lead you into that failure? Because the testament of scripture is that's what he does all the time. Abraham is going to leave Haran, leave where it's nice and cushy, the golf course house, retired. He's going to head out, and where does God lead him? Straight into a famine. That's where we get next week. Straight into a famine. Joseph is going to be following the Lord. He's going to get a vision from the Lord. He's going to be real excited. He's going to go tell his brothers, hey guys, rejoice with me. God's given me a vision. Where does that lead him? Straight into a pit, literally. He's naked, tossed into a pit. His brothers are contemplating taking his life. They decide not to kill him, but rather throw him into slavery. While he's in slavery, he decides to honor the Lord by not sleeping with Potiphar's wife. And where does that take him? It takes him to prison. What makes you think that following the Lord does not lead you into pain and suffering? The test in the scripture is, it often leads you into pain and suffering. Take a look at the Israelites. Here we are in Egypt. At least we're getting fed. At least we've got some good things. They talk about having pomegranates and cucumbers and they romanticize Egypt. And God calls them out and where does he take them? It says the Spirit of God led them into the wilderness for 40 years. What makes you think that God would not do the same with you? When David finally is anointed king and here he's expecting chariots and thrones and all sorts and the whole kingdom is opened up to him and where does God take them? God sends him into exile. Saul's now hunting him down. When John the Baptist is declaring the glory and the goodness of God, where does that end him? In prison where he's beheaded. Paul, when he starts following the Lord, goes from the hunter to being hunted and beaten down on a near weekly basis. Jesus Christ, after his baptism, it says that he followed the Spirit, and where did the Spirit lead him? Into the wilderness, into the desert, to be tempted and tested by the devil. What makes you think that God would work any different with you? Just because you were following the Lord and he led you into a tough season does not mean that he did not lead you into that tough season. It was intentional. Psalm 23 is my first message here at Summit. Do you remember what happens in that text? 
The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He leads me on paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What's the implication? The sheep is following the shepherd. What happens next in that series of verses? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. The implication of that whole thing is the sheep is following the shepherd. And where does the shepherd lead the sheep? Straight into the valley of the shadow of death. Just because you trusted the Lord and everything turned out really, really bad for you does not mean that you weren't following the Lord and it doesn't mean that he has you exactly, it does not mean that it's not having exactly where he wants you to be. Oftentimes, when we follow the Lord, things do not necessarily get better for us in a worldly sense. They get worse for us. And the question you have to be asking is, why? Why would he do that? What's going on? Um, it'll be easier to see next week. But one of the reasons that God does it is oftentimes um, when we're following the Lord, we're still holding on to something in the past. We're saying, okay, Lord, I got my eyes fixed on you, and I'm trusting you, and I'm, I'm all in, Lord, and I love you, right? And we do this number where we're still holding on back here. You literally just saw it in this text that Abraham is still doing this number too. How so? God told him to leave his family, to leave his everybody. But what do we see in the final verse, Miss Jenny, will you throw it up there for us? So Abraham went, as the Lord had told him, and Lot went with him. Wait a minute. God said, leave your family. Now all of a sudden, Lot's coming along too. Abraham is saying to the Lord, like we all do, okay, Lord, I'm following you. Yep, I'm right here with you. It's just you and me. Yep, but we're holding on to something else. So what did the Lord do? He oftentimes leads us straight to a valley, straight to a family, straight to a pit, uh, straight to a dark, trying, painful season. The question we have is why? It's because we just told the Lord that the only thing I want in this relationship with you is you. And the Lord said, that's exactly what we're about to produce. So the Lord will take you into a famine, a desert, pit, to teach you this. You only know, you only see that the Lord is all you need until the Lord is all you have. So oftentimes, as you jump out there and say, great, okay, Lord, I trust you and you alone, the Lord says, we're going to make that a reality in your life. And he takes you into a, a tough, dark season to establish just that. And here's what you have to understand. This is the whole point of the text is just because things got hard for you, as they're going to get very hard for Abraham, uh, just because things get difficult, challenging, just because you find yourself in a valley, that does not mean that the Lord is not with you and that he's not working in your life. We do not, this is the point of the story of Abraham and what you maybe need to know heading into 2022. We do not measure God's presence or God's favor based on our circumstances and on the outcomes. We base it based on his promises to us. I am with you. That it will be the story of Abraham moving forward. Homeboy is 75 years old. Not only does God uproot him, but in just a minute he's going to say, hey, you know your really old wife? Yeah, you guys are going to have a baby together. You know what happens in the text? Both of them laugh out loud at God. You got it. You kidding. And it doesn't even happen instantaneously. And so the story of Abraham is him trusting God despite the circumstances, not measuring God's presence or God's favor by his circumstances, but measuring God's presence and God's favor by God's promises. That's what the Lord has for you in 2022. Whatever this next big decision is for you, he would encourage you to do just this. Keep your eyes on him. Focus on him. See him as the destination, not leading you to some other destination. It's you not coming to him saying, hey, I'm in this relationship for your stuff. It's coming to him and saying, I'm in this relationship for yourself. And he says, okay, then follow me. Uh, if you abide in my word, you are my disciples. If you abide in my instruction, you are following me. So it's pressing into his word, and it's slowly, inch by inch, minute by minute, hour by hour, day by day, week by week, month by month, year by year, keeping your eyes on the Lord, saying, okay, we're going here, we're going here even if that results in how the world would describe failure. Does that make sense? Um, Strike 
if all you get in 2022, and I'm saying all you get in 2022, is more of the Lord, would that be enough for you? If you say yes and amen to that, and I know what that means and I know what that costs, then God has already done an incredible work in your life. If, based on this text and what we've been talking about recently, you're willing to say to the Lord, I'm not there yet, but that's where I want to be. God has already done a great work in your life. I don't know what your resolutions are. I don't know what the big decisions are that you're contemplating and that you're wrestling with this year. Let me tell you what the Lord's been working on in my life this week is, Dave, I have nothing for you except myself. Is that enough? And I've been throughout the years just like Abram. They go out and say, yeah, Lord, I trust you. I'm glad. Yeah, Lord, I trust you. Slowly but surely he's been whittling my fingers off of all the other idols and all the other anchors in my life to finally trust him. I guess I think what this text is all about is it's the Lord screaming at us, saying, this year, will you pursue me for me and find out that I am enough? I don't know what your goals and hopes and dreams are. I don't know what decisions you're thinking through. That's the one that the Lord wants you to actually be wrestling with. That's the thing that he wants you to be focusing on. Whether you're laying in the promised land, whether you're laying in Haran, whether you're laying in Egypt, I don't know. Whether you're laying in a famine, I don't know. But what the Lord wants you to know this year is uh, he extends his hand. He says to you what he says to Abraham, will you follow me? Will you search me out as your destination? That's what I think the Lord has. I know that, that's, what, that's what he has for us in scripture, that's what he has for us in his word. I hope that it is for you enough. If it's not, beg him that it might be enough. I'm going to pray for us. We're going to jump into a time of communion where we reflect on these truths and who the Lord is and what he's done on our behalf. This is the time for us, um, for those of us who are believers in Jesus Christ, who don't have any um, tension or animosity between us and other believers to partake in the elements, uh, the juice for his blood, the bread for his body. And in this next song, um, I just encourage you to think about today's message, what the Lord's maybe calling you to do as we partake in the elements. And in the second third song, we'll all stand in the same and pray for us. Psalm Father, we thank you and praise you for how good and gracious you are to us all the time. Our Lord, we just ask that you pour out your mercy upon our heads, that we might see you for who you are. Lord, I believe it's Hebrews that will later say, so Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. And so, Lord, um, we recognize that that's the way that you, that's the call that you have in our lives as well. A call to yourself. But you're asking us to leave everything we've known behind and pursue you for you. And Lord, uh, so many of us, myself included, are holding on to a thousand other things. Lord, and if that means you need to take us through a famine, you need to dump us in a pit, you need to um, take us through a valley, Lord, we ask that you do that. Lord, that we might later conclude, as Abraham does, that you are enough. Whom have I in heaven but you, and earth has nothing I desire except you. Please guide us as you so see fit. Pour out your mercy upon our heads. Please bless us with more and more of yourself in 2022, for we know that that's actually what you want us to see, want us to um, experience. We love you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.